Welcome everyone to Senate Education. Today is Tuesday, April 16th at 1.18. We're doing a little <clears throat> preparation for our uh, confirmation hearing uh, on Tuesday, April 23rd, our hearing of Secretary, now Secretary Saunders, who was appointed Secretary of Education officially, or began yesterday. Uh, for those watching and interested, I want to reiterate a couple of things. Number one, the hearing will be in this room. Uh, and we have, uh, we will be reserving room, a couple of chairs for Secretary Saunders' uh, family or friends, a couple that are committee assistant. Otherwise, I suspect the rest of the room will be for the press. Um, and uh, if people are interested in submitting testimony, please do so. <clears throat> you can send it directly to our committee assistant, Morgan Feldman. Uh, and Mr. Feldman's email is mfeldman, correct? Yes. At ledge.state.vt.us. You can find it online. And uh, he will be compiling all of the testimony that we receive and make it available to uh, the committee members prior to um, taking any action on uh, Secretary Saunders. So to prepare a little bit, we do have the Sergeant at Arms in, uh, and we're going to have the Chief of Police in. Uh, he'll stop by at some point. And then we have Secretary Bloomer in. Secretary Bloomer will come in and talk a little bit about, um, a little bit more about process, a little bit more around background, and a little bit around uh, the various motions that are, op that are actually an option that day. Uh, and how, if the committee decides to advance the secretary to the full Senate, what that would look like, etc. And just open for general questions. But now we have uh, Ms. Kessler ahead of, in front of us, uh, our Sergeant of Arms. Hi, Chief. How are you? Well, thank you. Good. Good to see you. Please feel free to join us. Thank you so much. And Chief, we're just uh, preparing a little bit for Tuesday. Uh, we were just talking about uh, Secretary Saunders' hearing. Um, and I think the big thing for everybody watching, and just to reiterate to the two of you, uh, this is where we're going to have the, have the hearing. Very small space. <clears throat> we could get people that want to be in here. Uh, but there wouldn't be room for them. We are reserving a couple of chairs for the nominee, uh, family or friends, and then I suspect we'll have a lot of press in here as well, cameras, that sort of thing. I don't know if people are, uh, those that have been communicating with me who've been asking, are there opportunities to testify in person? I've made it clear that no, that is the committee's decision has, uh, to not have people testify in person. However, if they'd like to submit information or any written testimony, they can do so through Morgan Feldman, our committee assistant. And I think really just to give the two of you a heads up that uh, if people do start showing up, we'll leave it to the two of you to help us, if that's OK, deal with any crowd or direction that people might need to receive around uh, not being in the room. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, Agatha Kessler, Sergeant at Arms, for the record. So, we would handle it in much the same way we would any other issue that brings that raises a lot of awareness and brings people to the building. Um, one of the great parts of the live stream is that people can be engaged with the process without having to enter the committee room. Um, and this is a small committee room, so I think it's it's wise to have a plan for how you're going to use the the seats that day. Um, we have some overflow spaces. So I took a note that the confirmation hearing will happen on <coughs> April 23rd, um, and I'm, I'm assuming at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. <coughs> 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. And so what we can do is find some over, overflow spaces so that members of the public who come to the building who may or may not realize that they can or cannot get into the, into the room because that can be a frustrating experience, drive to Montpelier and then not be able to fit in the room. So we will find some spaces, we'll try to find some spaces where they can overflow Thank and you. still be in the building. Um, and live stream it. Live stream. Exactly. Um, so 
um, the problem is there are not very many overflow spaces available in the building, but we will do our best to keep it here on site. Um, and then depending on the crowds, we may <coughs> have to overflow um, into 109 State Street. We have space over there um, on permanent reserve. So that's how we would handle any issue that brings a large crowd to the building. Um, if it gets bigger or disorderly, um, then that's when the Capitol Police would come into play and could help with crowd control or with communication and education about how to, how to be um, an observer of the hearing, not a participant of the hearing, but an observer of the hearing. So that's kind of a, just a little bit of background of how we would handle that, um, how we can handle that. We have been receiving calls at the Sergeant at Arms office, as we always do, with issues that raise a lot of awareness. Um, and we've been delivering those messages to legislators as they come in. So that's also another kind of gauge of when we know that there's an issue coming up that um, raises a lot of awareness is we'll see the call volume pick up. And so it gives us a little heads up of what to expect for the day. Center Weeks. I'm oh, just curious, uh, 109 State, what is that known as? So I'm other? sorry, it's the Pavilion. Oh, Pavilion. The Pavilion sorry. Building, which is not ideal because you do, you know, when people drive to Montpelier to observe or participate in a legislative hearing, you would expect it to be under the Golden Dome. Um, and part of um, crowd control and part of giving constituents a good experience when they come to Montpelier is to um, meet their expectations, and so it's kind of, I would say, frustrating to have to go off-site to watch a meeting. You could do that from home. So that would not be ideal to have to have overflow at the pavilion, but it is a very reasonable um, solution should we need that kind of space. That's if we exceed what's available here at 115 State Street. Thank you. Ms. Kessler, and I think I'm also looking to Morgan on this, <coughs> is there a way to advertise that you know, we're not going to be taking any can we do anything more than what we're doing people might be watching live stream people might be cons uh, sharing information with their constituencies mm -hmm. whatever that constituency might be is there anything else and maybe Morgan you could work with IT to perhaps put something on our page that says if you're interested in submitting testimony please feel free to do so uh, yes. And then anything else from your end? Um, well, we uh, we could deliver that message when people call the okay. state house. Mm -hmm. um, now we have more information about how you're going to handle the confirmation hearing. We'd be more than happy to share that when people call. Um, we are the main number, 828-2228, and several members actually have that phone number listed as their phone number. Right. So we receive a high volume of phone calls. Um, so that would be an effective way to communicate it. Does the uh, building itself or the Sergeant of Arms Office have any social media presence? Facebook, Twitter, or they, what are the kids called today? X? X, yes. Yeah. Um, so no, except that the Capitol Police does have a Facebook page. So we can talk okay. about posting something on the Capitol Police Facebook page um, to get the word out there. I do think it's a great idea um, to put something on your agenda, right. and Morgan has access through the through the agenda module to hand type some notes. I believe mm -hmm. um, that you, you know you could put a notation under that two o'clock time slot that this is um, being held in room six. With um, uh, please submit written comments to. That's a nice indication that like this is not a public hearing. Yep. Um, agendas are set ahead of time, and witnesses are listed as a prudent practice to put the public on notice of what's being discussed. So if your name's not on the agenda, the member of the public should assume that they're not speaking. Um, if it was a public hearing, that would be a different story. Um, so. And I think it's okay for more than you can actually put, why don't you post next week's agenda as soon as possible today, just for that Tuesday, two o'clock. This is not a public hearing. If you're interested in submitting testimony, please do so. Okay. Senator Williams, just, please. Just a question. Jason Malucci has the, the governor's uh, oh. website. Mm -hmm. And might be, might maybe the governor would want to mention 
you know, if people show up and they can't do what they expect them to do, mm -hmm. they may not be happy with it. Mm -hmm. So then they're not going to be interactive. This is not going to be an interactive Zoom session. So. Not a bad idea. We'll loop to the governor's office if they're interested in notifying people also. This Very good idea. Yes. For their press, it's their press secretary in the loop meeting too. Okay. Thank you. Chief, anything from us that you need? Or we, again, more of a heads up, an opportunity to just talk things through a little bit? Of course. So I believe our approach should be focusing on what we can control and then be preemptive in our efforts to make sure that we're getting the word out you know, through multiple channels. In terms of law enforcement, uh, we put out a notification to the Intelligence Center so they will uh, begin to view open source channels and social media to see if there is any indication that it could be a larger than uh, expected turnout in terms of people showing up to the Capitol building. Uh, we have notified Montpelier and our surrounding agencies, uh, the state police. Uh, we've talked to Captain Munson of the state police and she's a really in charge of operations. So she can have additional assets here if we believe uh, posted offsite if we believe it would escalate to a point where we potentially may need them. So we're going to just work in collaboration with all our partners, uh, keep an open dialogue in terms of our communication with everybody. And again, I think if we, we are, uh, in our approach, unified in putting the word out about what type of environment people can expect, then it may act as a deter uh, deterrent to some degree and letting them post something rather than showing up uh, physically to the state house. Yeah. And all I'm really just expecting are people that might arrive and be disappointed that they can testify and having this other option is terrific. Absolutely. And the unintended um, impression that they're being excluded, which is absolutely not the case. Right. You know, there is a space limitation in the state house, and I can just imagine and anticipate if someone came here expecting that they'd be a part of at least in the same room as the confirmation and then they're not even there's no space for them in the room it could send the wrong message and it's not meant to exclude them it really is just a, a space limitation so the more that those limitations and the expectation can be communicated out ahead of time which you always point um, people arrive in Montpelier knowing what to expect Committee, anything else from either our Sergeant of Arms or Chief of Police? Anything from either of you? No, and certainly it's a fluid situation, so uh, if we learn of anything or if anything uh, may come up on your end, we'll keep open communication and uh, come up with a, an action plan that's effective, keeps everybody safe. Great. Thank you both so Thank much. You're welcome. Thank really, you. really very much appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Good morning. So Secretary Bloomer is going to be coming down momentarily, but I thought I asked Beth to, um, and I have not gone through this, but I asked her to print or to provide us with Title 16 of the Secretary of Education position. Here we go. Here's some more. And I think what I was... Uh, as I'm preparing, and I know everybody is preparing their own questions, uh, but as we are uh, preparing for Tuesday, I thought it might be helpful to look at the Secretary's general duties and responsibilities, which are highlighted in the packet, and then um, a little bit uh, around um, the position itself and the process. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, the other thing, point of clarification question that was raised by Secretary Bloomer in a meeting this morning was how long, if the secretary is confirmed, how long will she be uh, in office? And I will confirm the email from Ms. St. James, but I believe she would serve until February. And at that point, she would either be reappointed by the governor for a similar confirmation process or not be reappointed by the governor. So, 
and that's directly related to election results and da da da. Is that, Correct. Is that kind of the generally situation? agency secretaries? Uh, Secretary Bloomer was saying it's a two. Well, they're a two-year position. Okay. And I'm going to pull this up so I can read. Uh, but he raised the question in a meeting in a conversation. Is that true also with the Secretary of Education? Um, and let me just read what Ms. St. James wrote back. So everybody has it. And then by that point, we will likely have the Senate Secretary in with us. Seems like you'd be a punctual person. I believe that if appointed, her appointment would likely run through February 2025, and then she would need to be reappointed for March 1, 2025, to February 2027. So again, if confirmed, February 2025, and then she would need to be reappointed for March 1, 2025 to a position that would go until February 2027. Okay. So her term is truncated based on, uh, based on when the last Secretary of Education resigned and this process? No, from, well, yeah, from the time she's beginning to when that term would have ended for Secretary Frencher. Okay. Yeah, That's okay. yeah. We're going to check with Secretary Bloomer. Yes. You can take us offline while we wait. Welcome back, everyone, to Secretary. Yeah, to Secretary. The Senate Education. We have with us now uh, Secretary of the Senate, John Bloomer, and continue our conversation in preparation for Tuesday's hearing with Secretary Sa Saunders. And we did just hear Secretary Bloomer from Agatha Kessler and John Polway a little bit about crowds and what we may or may not anticipate, how we can meet everyone's expectations and advertise that we are not hearing from the public but uh, in person, but if people want to submit uh, testimony, they're free to do so. What we thought we might have you here for is to talk to us a little bit about process um, and a little bit about motions and how we, Things, steps we would need to take to advance or not advance Secretary Saunders' nomination. So, the floor is yours. Very good. I, um, maybe I'll give you all an offer that we, we don't always get. I'll start talking. I can talk forever and talk very fast. And feel free to interrupt me at any time. I think it's actually not what your witnesses always expect, but I think it's much more conducive for you to be able to have an answer rather than have me. We're all very wise. We're really, we, never, we never forget. <laughs> we're but really it's easier good for me to get back on task. I yeah, we're think. really good at interrupting, as you can see. We're really good at just interrupting. <laughs> Sorry, who's, this woman, who's this woman over there? <laughs> <laughs> so let me kind of just kind of give you some process. <clears throat> some of you or all of you kind of know the most of it. Whenever there's an appointment by the governor, uh, we receive a letter. And that letter tells us who the person is, what their address is, what position they are being appointed to, and the term. And, and has that letter been received yet? It has not. Okay. Um, generally, I also did do that in case people want to know. Yeah. We don't usually receive them before they start. Correct. Uh, which is, as we've had some people ask, we've run back through our data bank. Uh, every now and then we'll get one before they're appointed. Usually it's after, um, quite frequent it's after, if it's an interim during the time when you are not here. We receive them probably the second or third week of January. But it's not unusual for us to not have it yet. And just so the committee knows, we, I've reached out to the governor's office in the letter they are anticipating sending a letter. It's my understanding we sh should be receiving it this week, if not yeah. today or tomorrow. Um, I will tell you, we did reach out to make sure that my office had staff if they wanted to deliver it yesterday. And we were told it was not yesterday. But we, our, my job, our staff's job, is to make sure we facilitate whatever we do all need. So we generally will receive a letter. That letter is then frequently the next day. Sometimes it can be two days if we get a whole stack because we have to enter them into a database. But they're eventually read on the floor. If it's a single person like this would be, we would read the person's name, 
Bennett referred to the Committee on Education, and it would go up to you. If it's a, you may have heard, if it's a staff of 35, we say something like, we've now received 35 appointments from the governor. They're being referred to their respective committees. And it'll be contained in today's journal, which you will receive on your desks tomorrow. <laughs> and then you can look, and you can see all of the old days. Sometimes they would read them all, but probably for the last couple of decades, it's been sort of, it's a group, we do it that way. Um, we will, one or two we usually read. When it gets to three or more, I leave it to the lieutenant governor's discretion as to whether he or she wants to do them individually or as, as a group. That then comes down, we give, um, assistant secretary uh, Melissa would give the appointment to the clerk, and the clerk, like a bill, brings it down to the committee. Once it's in your committee, you have possession of it. Um, it's just like a bill, anything can be taken out of committee, put in committee, it's, you're supposed to give a recommendation to the Senate as a whole, which needs to eventually act upon. You can do your hearing. Those have a very, depending on the appointment, depending whether it's a commissioner, depending on how controversial they are or not. Um, if it's something that's not a commissioner or a secretary, as you may know, sometimes you're assigned people to call up and there's the list, and if it's somebody on the board of umpty ump dump, you may not do a lot, but you at least move them up and take it onto a, to a calendar. The, the amount of a hearing you have to do is, is really within the discretion of the, the, uh, the committee. I believe most commissioners and secretaries I'll have, I'll have an in-person hearing. Uh, I don't know of any that have not. But once again, it depends on where, where the gradient is. Whether or not you call other witnesses is really among what you all decide. I think you are uh, receiving background from not only myself and other individuals today, but I think one other time on your calendar. Um, or your, your agenda, I think I saw it, which might be appropriate. I think the people you have coming later in the week are probably going to explain the process for the Board of Education and how, how that process works, which is a little different than uh, somebody who's on the environmental board, because that comes through the, the governor's office. This, I believe, is some sort of a nominating process and it works through. So I, I, um, I think it's good that you're hearing kind of how that process works so you have an understanding. You eventually complete your hearing. Um, and then at that point, the person's in this, um, in this committee. You have a number of choices. Um, if you want to forward the person to the full floor, I'll get back to the sort of the quotations in, in a moment, you have really three choices. You need a positive vote out of this committee. Not positive in recommending the uh, appointment, but you need a 3-2 vote or a majority of the committee to have the nomination go to the floor. You have really three choices that I know of from this committee's perspective. One of them is you can recommend it favorably. Two is you can recommend it adversely. Or three, you can vote it out with no recommendation. You need, those are all motions. Some motion has to carry. Okay. So if someone moves that it be favorable, if it's 3-2, then they come out favorable with 3-2 vote, it would be explained on the floor with the, if it's 2-3, they don't come out favorable. You can then have a motion that they are unfavorable. And if it gets three to two, then they come out unfavorable. If it gets two to three, they don't come out. Right? It may seem weird, but you may have, somebody may not want the person even on the floor, and so they don't, they're not, you're not, it's not a binary vote, yes or no. It's does it come out positive, does it come out negative? And the alignment of those people does not have to make common sense necessarily to you as you're looking. Yes, sir. please. Thank you. So the motions, all of the, the possible motions, are to confirm or not to confirm in this committee? So. Or to move out to the Senate? It would probably be to report. To report. Favorably. Favorably. OK, so there is no vote in here to confirm or not confirm. They're just like a bill you don't vote on. Sorry, so people There's no the motion so, so to confirm or not confirm. No, because okay. the Senate's the only one who can really. You can do a report. So I, mis report? I misunderstood that when you when we talked oh, last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so, so your the, the motion. I mean, it depends on how you want to word it. We sometimes get little lags, but it's really going to be you're going to report them out favorably or unfavorably, and whoever the reporter is, or with no recommendation, which is your third option. And the no recommendation also takes three votes. The only thing you can do. Can you say that again? So there are three ways of having the person out of the committee. Report favorably, you vote adversely or not to confirm, and with no recommendation. Just like a bill. You can do all three of those. 
But to have any of those be successful, it takes at least three votes if you're all here. Now, I just want to make sure, because I've seen at least once in the last five years, somebody on a committee vote no on all three. And it was three, two, every way. Sorry, two, three, every way. Because they were the third vote, and they didn't want this bill out of the committee. So somebody moved to make it, you know, report it positively with an amendment. It's two, three. Somebody moved to report it adversely. Two, three. Somebody voted, moved to revert it with no recommendation. It was two, three. That third vote was that person kind of jumping around because they just wanted the bill to die in their committee. So same idea here with the nomination. You've been assigned this, this uh, not, uh, appointment, and to have you guys make a report, it has to have somebody who can go up and explain the majority's position, which takes majority of those present, or it takes three of all five of you are here. There's, a third, there's another way of getting a bill, uh, a bill or a nomination on a committee. If it's stuck in your committee, and you guys are all on that two, three stop, somebody on the floor can move to relieve the committee of the nomination. There will not be a report on the floor. People can stand up and do their own thing, but to have a committee report, you need a positive vote of some number. And then, but you can, if you all decided not to bring the nomination out, someone could move to relieve it. In that sense, it would go on the notice count, just like it will with a bill or with a, with a report from this committee. So there are, those are sort of the, the motions you can make. There's, uh, there's other motions we, I don't know if you want me to cover, but it's um, the nominations frequently, um, long ago, used to all come out. They don't always all come out um, nowadays. Um, there was a, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm interrupting. No, um, sure. sure. Can you give us an example of what the language w will slash would be so that we know how to word the motion? Oh, yeah, I can give you some. I, um, it's going to, I always like to think and contemplate, and be, but it's going to be something like I move that uh, committee on education report the nomination of blah 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 as secretary, whatever, secretary of education favorable or reverse okay. or without recommendation. If there's no recommendation, then there is no report. Mm -hmm. okay. So. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in caucus today was when I sort of explained that this is going to happen on the 23rd, 2 o'clock. Uh, I then said, and we'll leave it to, we'll be working with the pro tem's office in terms of timing on the floor. What's the soonest, if the pro tem wants this to be on the floor, what's the soonest it could be up and ready to go? So is it like a wait, or is it sort of handled like a bill? It could be pulled off notice, yeah. put on notice, all that kind of thing. So at the very end of your calendar, it's more and more of you should be there. Yes, You put the bills, which you all on the table of contents, and there'd be like a resolution. There's stuff at the end. Like your confirmations are in your calendar every day. There's currently right. like seven, six or seven of them there. Those that are underlined, we need to report. This one will have an underline. Yeah. The date that's there is the date that they can be up for action. And so that's usually a day after a notice. Uh, so when it first comes up, if you voted it out today, it would be on notice tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And without a rule suspension, the soonest it would be up would be Thursday. Right. We generally take up nominations on Fridays, but this sure. uh, whatever leadership and the body decides to do, <coughs> we've done Fridays, and, but they yeah. do not have to do Fridays. Right. That's just sort of a way that well, five or six years ago we started kind of making a process. So they didn't sit till the very end. Some, sometimes they would be on the calendar for two or three months. Yeah, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> so yes. Or more. Senator Weeks, please. So then the, the, um, the floor vote, what are the options for voting there? Is it just yay and nay? Well, okay, that's an interesting question. Um, it will be a roll call. It is, it is um, uh, a couple of things. Uh, there will be a roll call probably requested. It's not automatic. The only automatic roll calls are things like constitutional questions that are in the Constitution. But we have not done the commissioner or somebody without a roll call. We had, used to be Senator Sears who did it. We have Senator Collimore who does it. There, I expect there to be a, a request. The, the underlying question shall be said, 
kind of the question I read. Till the appointment of blah, 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 be confirmed by the consent to such and such for such and such a term. Do we have a little script? I didn't bring it down, but we have a script that the, we give to the lieutenant governor. That is then really a yes or no. Um, you know, it is, you are, have a great question, because with a bill, I'd probably treat it different. So I'm going to run through something probably, I don't know if anybody on the table has ever seen before. So generally, a bill can be voted out adversely, and which is where your question kind of comes. So if it comes out adversely, it is going to be, you know, sort of that we don't, we recommend it not be confirmed. So we're going to take that as a yes and a no vote, kind of the way that we've described it. Yes, if you want the person to confirm it, no, if you don't. If you vote on a bill adversely, it's a different process. Okay. So the, because the first question then is, shall the bill be killed? That's not really the question. Is shall the bill be, you know, not packed, not read the third time? And, and if that is, if that fails, then you can amend the bill and move it back the other way. But with a confirmation, we will always be request uh, doing it as a positive vote. So even if the committee says the person should not be confirmed, the question will be worded, shall they be confirmed? And I think it's most important because the public will, I don't want to mess up the public with yes and no votes when people try to look at what the question is. It's very difficult if you suddenly have someone voting no, which means they really mean yes, and yes when they really mean no. And so my belief is we will make it as a positive vote. If you do not want to confirm her when you're on the floor, it'll be a no vote. And if you do, it'll be a yes vote rather than make it very confusing. And like a bill, there'll be, there can be debate, there can be comments, people get up. Like, How about a reporter? So, yes, so uh, if it comes out with a 3 2 or 4, whatever, whatever the positive vote is, they would be reporting for the committee on whatever that report is. Um, we, so, say that, say that um, it's 3 2. So, the person, there's somebody assigned a report. They come up, they report, positive or negative. Um, do you have not seen a lot? It used to be much more frequent. Uh, other positions on the bill. Sorry, Mr. Chair. But you know, sometimes other committee people that have been opposed to it are can stand up and say, "Why? Yes. You, you all have the last five or six years since COVID been very well behaved." Uh, Maybe because I tell everybody they have to be. But it is. But there. Are, but sometimes you're entitled to explain. The person reporting cannot explain why somebody else voted no. That would be improper. But you, if you voted no in a bill on a committee, you're entitled to stand up and explain why. And also, you know, we don't really have formal minority reports, but with a confirmation or with a bill, you're entitled to say what you think and why. Um, so there, there can be, but the committee position will be by reporter if it comes out either favorably or unfavorably, and they would present that case or that explanation as to why the committee landed where they did. Um, the other, other thing I was, <clears throat> was going to mention was um, your, your other option um, is not to take it up at all uh, or to take it up and not vote it out if you, or if you can't get it out. Um, historically, most nominations or appointments came out 20 or 30 years ago. There was a bit of a controversy and sort of a uh, way of protesting uh, appointments sometimes. They just didn't come out of committee. And, and the background on that briefly, I don't want to uh, the background briefly on that is back in the early 90s, um, most of the time appointments were taken up. There was an appointment that was a very controversial on the Senate floor. It was probably the last time anybody was not confirmed on the Senate floor. It was back in 94. There was an environmental board put together. There were four or five, member, or five members on the board. Uh, they took them all up. Three of them were not confirmed. Two of them, I think, were. Um, Howard Dean was the governor, and then the next week Howard Dean reappointed the exact same three people. They were taken up two weeks later and not confirmed again. Matter of fact, the second time around, the lieutenant governor, I think, had to break either one or two of the appointments. Um, so the reason I mention that is that after that process... Was that Barbara? I guess that was the prototype. It was Elizabeth Courtney. I get to the material yeah. pieces if you want. But that's my understanding the last time someone was not confirmed. It was a really, it was, it was five, right? That there were five people they were voting on. It was a pretty long, they actually went into the evenings for some of the reports and coming back. And it was it was a difficult time for the Senate. Once again, you have to all do your job. It's just, it, it's not, it is, it's, um, it is not um, sort of typical um, to not confirm. We, it's not what we see in D.C. 
um, well, frequently people are blocked just to block. If you have good reason, you should, but if you don't, it's not usually done as a political statement, at least in, in, in Vermont. The other thing, um, this is a potentially different. You'll want to maybe get um, uh, council's uh, input on two, two things. One of them, um, which I briefly mentioned to the chairs, what the term is. I believe the term goes to, to, to February 28th. Um, you are so, correct. We did get that. So it's not like a four-year term. At one time, there's some appointments that are like longer. Um, so it's the, they will come. If, if the person is confirmed in education, they will come back up next year again. The, uh, the second thing, is, which is a little bit different, is that uh, I gave you this example for Howard Dean and the Environmental Board. The, this is a slightly different because it comes through a board that nominates. And so I'm not, I don't think there's a correct legal answer, but I don't know whether or not if the person was not confirmed if they could be reappointed from the same pool, or whether they'd have to get a separate pool, uh, or whether that would delay there being a, a, somebody in charge of the education. I do not have, it's different. It's a little bit like the Green Mountain Care Board, or the Great cannabis, yeah. cannabis Board, where you're nominated through your screen, and then the names are forwarded. Uh, or judicial nominating with the names are forwarded. Sometimes the judicial nominating, they ask for additional names, um, but, but if somebody is, the current way that education works, I believe it's sort of forwarded names, I don't know what the process is, and I don't think you're gonna get a definitive answer, but it's one you at least wanna kind of know the parameters of what happens if you don't confirm. Well, yeah, so if statute is silent on that issue, to whom, to whom would we pose the question? Somebody's going to court. Unless there's a definitive answer, you can talk to counsel about doing, I mean, so I'm a lawyer. So it's sort of like, I don't know, so they reappoint the same person. person right. Under our system, under our system generally, it's different than DC. When you're appointed by the governor, you will serve until you're not confirmed, or you're, you're found to be not appropriate. And that's different than DC, it's why we don't have them like as designees and all the other stuff, they serve. So I don't know, somebody would, if they were, if they were reappointed, then maybe they serve until they're told they're not. And I don't know if that's a core. I don't know where that comes from. And I, it, may be clear, it may be clearer in the statutes than I know, I just don't have the answer for it, and I think you should. Find out what the answer is so you know all your alternatives. Senator Weeks. So hypothetically, they could, a nominee could come off the floor without support. Um, there, there would be, um, there would be no um, uh, state board of education renomination unless there was a court challenge. They would continue to serve until February. No, um, so if they, if they, if there, if there's a floor vote, and I'm just going to use hypothetical. It's 10 to 12, or it's 14, 16, or whatever. They are no longer the the commissioner, or secretary. 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 I just want to make sure I get it sort of right. So the secretary, they have not been confirmed, so they cannot serve any longer. The difference is back in '94, the governor Dean reappointed the same. Right. So if the governor, if the if governor Scott does not re try to reappoint the same person, there's a vacancy. And it's, then the question becomes, can he or she, the governor, use the existing pool? Do they have to get a new set of That's names? Do, I, I don't have the answers to that process. Okay. But in the old, with the 94, there was not that process. It was just the governor could appoint who they wanted to. And so they, Governor Dean reappointed the same people. <coughs> but I don't don't know the answer at this particular circumstance. Anything else? You guys are an easy crowd. No, not really. <laughs> this has been incredibly helpful, incredibly mm -hmm. important. I left my cell phone in the office upstairs, so I'm going to go off. <laughs> <laughs> You do know, you do know how, that when you. How was your birthday? Yeah, it was really great. So you do know that, that the, the other attorney at this table will probably tell you that if you're going to commit a crime, you don't go in and rob a bank. And right before you do it, you pull your face mask down and wave to the cameras. So all of you that were involved and texted me, I know your name. Because <laughs> you're all there. <laughs>
Yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of hard to like defend you. It was fun. Yes, it was. I'm glad you guys had fun, actually. It's, I looked at it as a um, uh, team building, if nothing else. And I didn't mind being the brunt because I don't, as I probably told some of you, I don't think you guys have enough fun. You do very serious work, very important work. But you knew. I didn't say that. <laughs> I will, I will never confess one way or another because it would spoil the fun or not spoil the fun. Anything else? Uh, to me? We don't care. Okay, Good. yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Take care. Great to see you. Thank you. Oops. Oh, oh. Can you fix that? <laughs> Committee, take yeah. five minutes. Right. Welcome back, everyone, to Senate Education. Uh, we have Laura Stiegel, uh with us, who is going to weigh in on 8871. And before we do that, I just wanted to give everyone a heads up. It was asked when we were off line, uh, miscellane the Senate, mis the House Miscellaneous Education Bill that we have, will it be carrying money in it? And the answer is yes. If the committee decides it wants to fund community schools, Senate Appropriations Committee is willing to do that in the end fund. And that's it. So if people want to, I suspect you're not going to want to move forward with it. I suspect uh, others might not want to because it impacts the end fund. So we'll have to have a conversation about that if people want to. It impacts the end fund, but at least it goes to schools. So it's, at least it's like an appropriate, seems like an appropriate use. Please, okay, yeah, so think right. about it. Though. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a million, it could be, but you know, sure. just know that that's a little bit where it's at. Okay, uh, Laura, great to see you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, and you have written testimony here that you would like to share with us. So um, the floor is yours. And again, we are talking about H871. And this is our state aid to school construction uh, bill. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you so very much. Hello, everybody, members of this um, committee. I thank you for the opportunity to discuss this um, for the deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. When constructing or upgrading school facilities, ensuring accessibility for individuals who are deaf, hard of hearing, or deaf blind are just as important as accommodations for those with mobility issues. Here are some examples where a school construction could incorporate. First one, visual alert systems provide both audio and visual signals to notify individuals about fire alarms, doorbells, and emergency announcements. These systems typically consist of flashing lights, can be color-coded, or vibrating devices placed in areas where they can be easily seen. Number two, signage. Turn the lighting features on and off for restrooms, usages, e exits, and even emergency evacuation routes. For instance, when it comes to the restrooms, we should be able to access the stalls with dignity and not have to touch the floor to see if anything is behind those stalls or peek through the cracks. Accessibility communication devices number three, a public video phone, caption phone, or TTY should be easily accessible at all times on campus. A person with a hearing loss relies on such, te such technology to make and receive calls but is unable to do so if they are not permitted to use cell phones or other telecommunication devices during school hours. For instance, a student with a hearing loss should be able to make their own phone calls to their parents without relying on another. Number four, induction loop systems. Install induction loop systems in key areas such as auditoriums, meeting rooms, reception desks, and even classrooms to transmit audio signals directly to hearing aids or cochlear implants equipped with telecoil technology. This allows individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing 
to hear amplified sound without background noise or interference. Number five, accessible telecommunication infrastructure. Ensure that the building is equipped with telecommunications infrastructure, including compatible phone systems, caption phones, and text messaging services. This enables individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind to communicate effectively with building occupants, emergency services, and external contacts. Number six, accessible restrooms. Design restrooms that are accessible and inclusive. Install visual alarms and indicators to alert users of occupancy status. Provide clear sign it with universal symbols and incorporate adequate space and accommodations. Number seven, elevators and front door. Include video cam for visual communication. Intercoms are intended only for those who can hear. Understand the person speaking on the other end or the buzzing noise. We shouldn't be dependent on others for our communication access or safety. In moments of adrenaline rush, individuals often focus solely on their own concerns, disregarding those of others. I personally experienced being overlooked or dismissed in both student and teacher roles in various school scenarios. As a teacher, I was often patronized and reprimanded for not responding as quickly as hearing individuals. There was insistence that I always be accompanied by a hearing staff member, but it never happened. I sincerely doubt it ever will. With those accommodations in place, there won't be a need because we deserve to be able to maintain our independence in all settings, home, work, and even school. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, committee, questions? Uh, I can tell you one thing. I, I don't know if this is going to be good news for you, uh, Ms. Siegel, or not, but we have put uh, your organization uh, in the bill. So uh, you might be called upon to do additional testimony as we make our way as the committee makes its way through its process to uh, ensure that buildings are indeed uh, prepared to provide the best services for the deaf and hard of hearing. So a little extra work for you possibly, uh, but we appreciate your willingness to, to be a part of it. And uh, as I said, the way we have it listed in our new draft, you can tell us if this is wrong. We're going to be going through it this afternoon. The, the working group would need to consult with a number of different agencies, including the Department of Disabilities, Aging, Independent Living, Deaf, Hard of Hearing, Deaf, Blind Services. That is how it is listed in the new draft of uh, H871. Does that make sense? Perfect. Yes, okay. it does. Perfect. Okay. Great, great, great. Uh, committee, any other questions? That was really helpful. That was incredibly helpful. It alerted us to a number of uh, uh, issues that I'm speaking for myself, I wasn't considering. So I, I, I appreciate your efforts on this front. Absolutely. I'm sure that maybe I've even forgotten some other things, but that was at what was on my mind. And that's what I could think of. And so I notated those. And um, I just did that on the fly. Well, impressive for on the fly. <laughs> even it would be impressive if it weren't on the fly. Uh, and if you do think of anything else, Ms. Siegel, please feel free to reach out to, to the committee assistant, Morgan Feldman, or any of us directly as we make our way through the process. This bill we hope to advance uh, possibly later this week or early next week. So please let us know. Okay, I will try to think of other things, but I'm pretty sure that this is, um, you know, the highlight. You know, these are the key issues that I think that really need to be included in the processing. Great, thank you. Bye. All right, I hope that's all. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate Bye. it. Thank you.
Bye. So committee, I'm wondering, so with this testimony H for 871, Ms. Siegel brings up a number of really good points. I don't know if there are ways that the committee are thinking of actually incorporating them into the bill or if we are intent or somewhat satisfied with just making certain that uh, Department of Disabilities, Aging, Independent Living, Deaf, Hard of Hearing, Deaf, Blind Services is going to be consulted. And that kind of, again, opens up all different kinds of opportunities to make sure that the needs of this community, uh, the EHHE needs, all that. Please, sir. Do you all, I don't see this as necessarily being part of the construction of the building. Do you guys see that? This seems like almost, it is, you think it is? I see this as like the second tier of like the, like putting in the infrastructure in the. To be in the planning phase of it. Okay. For sure. It's going to be, there's going to be additional costs because of the okay. potential. Okay. Yeah, no, I get that. Yeah. I'm, I was just thinking in terms of like the actual physical structure. It just seems like it's more like, but I, I don't know. I get that. Oh, yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess I was um, wondering if there's more about, I don't know, like, and maybe she'll come back with more testimony, but like the size of spaces or the set, you know, like the height of the ceilings or like things like that. Back to your question, it's reflecting what Senator Gulick just said. I think that it was very helpful that Ms. Siegel provided testimony. I think that including that group in the in the uh, essentially associated with the working group is uh, appropriate. Uh, but I don't think that the the um, specifics that she ran through were necessary to be included in the bill. I think the fact that she just right, really right, validated right. that their in, yeah. her input, that organization's input yeah. is germane. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks. Great. Great. Uh, okay, did you want to see if Eric Lafayette can join us? Uh, we're about five minutes early. Is he right here? He's coming in to, this is the second time he's coming in to actually make a case for the, the additions that you like in the bill. So this is more than his presentation. This is, uh, I wanted to come in and make the case. Yeah, Senator Chambers. Uh, quick question, do we have anything in here regarding the reuse of a closed building and you know because i'm looking at the section on efficiencies uh, you know I, i'm thinking you know the old school closes it down uh what's going to be used for next right uh, i know some schools are probably not be torn down but pcbs maybe but... oh you're thinking so you're saying um the next iteration of a school building if it closed yeah, yeah, and, and I imagine that might be part of uh, the historic preservation uh, division. But I think um, I think it's an excellent point. It's something we need to consider because we're trying to deal with a you know one issue that has always unintended or intended kind of consequences and such. And I think that's uh, that's big. So so uh, it's a recommendation potentially some type of municipal group that recognizes you know solidarity of downtowns or whatever deal with that issue you know represent that issue i think it's it's a huge issue yeah it's every school we close down if if we generate a, a next use concept i think it would uh smooth the waters dramatically i agree i've been asked the same question I, would you want language in here i think it I mean, I know it couldn't hurt because I know that we have a section that's kind of a catch all that says, you know, in the, any other consideration or something along those lines. But you can spell it out. That's coming in at yeah. re, I think, okay. take us through this new version. We can add, you know, the amendments and the ideas that are put forward. Uh, we can add whatever people would like at that point. Uh, I think it's good stuff. Did Catherine Sims happen to reach out to you? Yeah. Is this what she wants also? Yeah, that was one of her suggestions. Do you remember what else she was hoping to get? That's all she said. Okay. Repurposing. Okay. Yeah. Great. We, um, uh, Act 46. When, yeah. when they, the towns 
gave up their buildings. Yeah. They, I think there was a clause in there that said if they were ever not used for education, they'd go back to the municipality. If that's the case, then it's not an issue. But uh, probably Beth would go. I think that was the leader now. Huh? But the, well, wasn't that from? Yes. Yeah, yeah, but Act 46 was well too. So, the, so the school merged with right. another. The town didn't have to give more. It was empty. Right. Okay. Well, good question. You'll ask that if that when she comes in. Right. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question about the run of play to the rest of the session? We've got this pill construction and we've got OCs. Yeah. Are we miscellaneous ed? Those three are our big three. Yeah. And then we also have uh, we are going to start joint a joint hearing with Senate Finance as soon as the yield bill leaves the House, because the yield bill has a lot of education policy in it, specific to this committee, Section 1, which I've asked Peter Conlin and Beth to come in and talk to us about tomorrow. Section 1 is House Education's, I think it's, they're calling it sort of rethinking public education or education transformation. A study document, and that is that I would say is going to be a big part of the work as well. Thank you. What? Thanks, go ahead. I think she missed one. She was looking for what what the priority bills were. Yeah, so those three plus the yield bill coming over. Yeah, and then I'm just what? No, I'm just saying that here's a here. I'm trying to answer. Oh, so that. what's the answer? PCD. Oh, which is we're covering from all. Oh, right, 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 right. Yep. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I, so I just want to keep elevating my S203 and wondering if that, if, if we are can still, because the plan was to put that on the miscellaneous head bill, what? Well, I've got good news and bad news. No, I don't have any bad news. <laughs> uh, I would say when Peter comes in tomorrow, I guess they have something in their bill that's similar. Okay. So take a look at what they have and let us know what you think. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I, I heard that a little bit through the great final to ask. Okay. So there are five bills that we're dealing with. Okay. Are you including that one as the fifth? No. Okay. So PCDs, yeah. BOCES, um, BOCES, school construction, miscellaneous. miscellaneous, and the SEAL bill. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As long as you're not counting 203. Oh, um, no. I'm kidding. Five and a half. <laughs> 203 <laughs> sailed um, past the Senate. Past crossover. I mean, it didn't get through crossover. Oh, yeah. No, we have a vehicle. It's, yeah. Yeah. And also, they are, interestingly enough, I haven't seen the details of it, but they're, you might like the language that they're using for the state court. You might not. But we should have that conversation with the house. Thank you. Uh, Morgan, anything from Mr. Uh, Lafayette? Nothing. Else. Okay. So when we block her, welcome everyone to Senate Education, Tuesday, April 16th, 2 32. In the afternoon. Uh, Mr. Lafayette, thank you for joining us. You sent us an email asking for H, request to H871. Uh, we have them right in front of us and wondering if you would take us through them and so the committee understands your, your reasoning for each. Okay, that sounds great. So, um, you know, I, I asked originally, I think it was on page three. Committee, so committee goes, we added them tentatively into the bill. So so if Mr. Lafayette directs us to a certain page, it should be there and then we can decide whether or not we want it or we pull it. Okay, sounds great. So on, on page three of 16 of the bill, um, there's note number H, um, which is uh, an energy audit with long-term planning for reduction of carbon dioxide and energy use. And this really goes in line with some of the other state energy bills um, on climate change that you guys have had uh, that have been passed in other um, uh, congressional settings. Um, but really, our thought on this is that, you know, the state has put out guidelines for carbon dioxide reduction and energy use. Um, so this kind of uh, review would be in line with other state bills um, and the long term goal of getting off of fossil fuels. By Senator Dealer. Eric, can you give us just super, super quick, like what an energy audit looks like for a school? Yeah, so an energy audit is essentially going to be a full, uh, an assessment of the building, and it's going to look at its electrical use, its um, fossil fuel use, or, or biomass, if it's using biomass, and its water use. And what you're doing is you're comparing 
um, its energy use typically to other peers in the state of Vermont. So that's part of what's called that energy use index that uh, is talked about lower in the process. But really the idea with the energy audit is that um, you're looking at how the building is currently performing. And then part of the audit is providing measures that will reduce their energy consumption with an associated cost to that measure. And then what the what the guaranteed savings are gonna be with it. And so what do an energy audit, who does one? Um, an energy service company would do an energy audit. So somebody like ourselves, um, an engineering firm could certainly do an en energy audit as well. Um, and then there's companies in specifically in the state of Vermont that are working with the municipalities um, doing, I think Dubois and King is doing the energy audits for all the state buildings, municipal buildings right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sinarchi. Thank you. Uh, on average, how much does an energy audit usually cost for an uh, SU, for an SU, um, well, in our in our business model, we actually provide the energy audits up front at no cost to the to the group, and that's part of our performance contracting uh, deal that we have with them. If you were to go to say do maybe like a typical elementary school um, at say you know thirty thousand square foot elementary school that might house a couple hundred kids, uh, you're probably looking at between five around five to seven thousand dollars of cost if you're going to work with engineering firm. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you want to please center weeks? So just a curiosity. So um can we get by with, with the language since we're truncating the sentence to say to provide an energy audit for long term with long term planning period? I mean we understand I mean, there are a variety of goals of energy audit, audit, uh, audits, and I'm just not sure the second part of the sentence is really. Uh, I agree. I agree with you on that. Um, I think the only thing, it is a little bit redundant in the fact that um, when you're talking about energy use, that is what an energy audit is. Um, my only part that I would put out there is that carbon dioxide emissions isn't always looked at during an energy audit. And I do think that um, having some language in there of looking at their CO2 production and alternate sources of energy use is, is in line with other bills that have been passed by the legislature. Senator Sheep. Did you have a follow, Senator Weeks? Uh, no, there'll be something to Senator Weeks. Uh, I think, so what, this might be a question for Senate Natural Resources, actually, a member of that committee, but. I'm trying to think about the other statewide goals and plans that we have, broadly speaking, uh, that look at the long-term reduction for CO2 and energy use. And I, I mean, uh, obviously I, I support CO2 reduction, but I also want to be wary of being duplicative um, and creating work for an SU that's already being covered under any other energy plans that we have statewide, statewide right now for state buildings and town buildings. Uh, but I think that would require following up with set of natural resources to see if we should help. Uh, We're inviting Peter Sterling in, and he is, do you know his title, Morgan? Uh, the director of... The director of... He doesn't say of. Uh, uh, or of renewable energy. renewable energy Vermont. So he works pretty closely with that uh, with that committee. So I've asked him to come in and to sort of give us a take also. But feel free to run it by anybody in that committee as well. I think Peter will be able to answer all the questions. Please. My, my two cents on the carbon dioxide aspect is that it's a really easy number to figure out when you're doing your energy audit because you're already in there looking at fuel consumptions, essentially you're utilizing like EPA charts to figure out how much that fuel consumption, how much CO2 is gonna be um, brought in by utilizing it. So it's not that it, I don't think it adds any real time or cost to the energy audit production, but it does give you kind of this um, ability to evaluate different HVAC systems on their CO2 output and long term. So not looking at just 
the energy use and its long-term operating expense, but also how that impacts CO2 production. So it's not that it's, it shouldn't be a real added cost to an energy audit to include that portion. Okay. Uh, please, sure, I'm just, yeah. Just a curiosity question. So it, it appears that on page three, from paragraph three down, that in dealing with the minimum requirements for an educational master, educational facilities master plan, you know, most of the, um, the items that are listed down to G are kind of like concept, like what are the goals of the master plan? Whereas an energy audit seems specific to facilities that already exist. And it's a little, to me, it's a little bit uh, out of skew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's kind of like you're putting the, court, the, the, the cart before the horse. Here, I think we're trying to create, okay, what's the vision? Not, you know, how do we take the vision and apply it to every single uh, educational facility across the state? That, that's my only row. I, you know, certainly we need to consider energy use and blah, blah, blah. But, Mm -hmm. I, I think you're right, and maybe what we can talk to Beth about is wordsmithing this in a way that says make certain buildings are constructed as energy efficient as possible, something like that. I think you're you're right. Rather than getting specific to the audit piece, you have to be. Would it help to say? Because up here you've got a description of a description of. Would it help to say a description of an energy audit, or is that energy goals? Yeah, yeah, like an energy, energy goals. I don't know. I don't know. Or make sure that the energy goals meet, as Senator Hashima saying, meet the statewide energy goals, right. something like that. Um, I agree with what you're saying. Statewide energy goals. I do, I would say that typically when you're looking at evaluating facilities and they're typically uh, like your mechanical systems. Um, do have a lot of times your biggest upfront expense in a renovation cost to a project. So having kind of an analysis of where you kind of see how your building's being operated, whether through fossil fuels or biomass or electric, it is pretty critical in, in kind of determining what the viable use of that building is and then um, the long-term planning around it. So having kind of a district plan of you know, that of fossil fuel reduction potentially um, or CO2 that falls in line with state, um, I think could be involved with the, the long-term district planning. Um, yeah, well, yeah, it's not at the district level, we're at the agency master level. Master plan. Yeah. Master plan. Okay. You know, again, I think you're, you know, everything you say is right, right? But, it, but it, I'm not sure it applies in this section. Okay. You know, when this master plan matures, the, What's contained on page three should be what are the guiding principles? Yeah. That's all. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Okay, please continue. Page four, section three, your recommendation. Uh, page four, section three, um, just adding energy service companies as a pre qualified consultant. Um, I think this could really help out uh, different school districts be able to find people to perform these audits for them. Um, and build a bigger book of business of people available to do these services. So just like architecture and engineering, um, you know, energy service companies provide, um, I think that kind of next level of evaluation, which is the cost evaluation and the funding aspect of it. Um, so we're just hoping that we could be included also as uh, a consultant um, to help with that in that sense. Can I play yeah. devil's advocate? Yeah. Can I consider can I consider an energy service company as an engineering company? I mean, isn't it? Aren't you providing engineering analysis specifically in your case to energy services? Absolutely. I mean, I'm trying to be yeah. I'm really trying to exclude a company like yours. I, I think we need you as part of the process. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Please. I'm I'm just wondering. Did you? We have. Uh, Global Warming Solution Act, which was passed in 2022, I think. Uh, and there are certain criteria in there that any new construction or state, had, we have to meet it. If we don't meet those goals, then state can get sued. So did you consult that Global Warming Solution Act when you, when you came up with your plan? Um. I have not, I mean, I, I, you know, I do talk about it. I know that we have 
you know, requirements to try to be net zero by 2050. Um, that was kind of what I was trying to put in there about that CO2 and tracking the CO2 reduction, um, but um, not kind of specifically, but that is kind of my thought on energy audit auditing and efficiency and why it should be built into the school construction aid because we have so many other acts related to global warming that we really haven't brought into CO2 um, uh, or any global warming aspects into the school construction aid. So that's kind of what why I brought some of these amendments up to the bill in the first place. Yeah, and, and I appreciate it because it's giving us some, some, some conversation around energy efficiency and the need to meet our statewide energy goals and Global Warming Solution Act. Uh, so I do appreciate the conversation. But yeah, let's stick, as Senator Weeks said, with engineering consultants and leaving it there. Uh, you go now to page six. Uh, eligibility requirement, eligibility, eligibility criteria under section C. So I think this is on our page seven. Page seven, yep. Yep. So a requirement for supervisory unions to perform an energy audit on a building that would evaluate buildings energy use and provide recommendations and costs um, to reduce it. So, I mean, that that's pretty straightforward, but that's really just making sure that um, every time before, you know, the school construction aid moves forward with awarding somebody the funds that they have a requirement to look at um, all the different options and long term planning on different types of systems. Um, and that that not necessarily that they'd have to pick the plan that moves off of it, but at least be able to um, evaluate it and then review any state and federal grants that could help potentially in those two items. So I think that's one big item that a lot of times design firms um, often look over is those state and federal grants and how that has an impact on the total project cost. Um, it's pretty imperative for us to get financing for our projects that we have, that we use these state and federal grants to make the, to make the finances work on these performance upgrades. Um, and I, I think in general, it would be good practice for the state to try to utilize all available grants, state and federal, um, and, you know, and that's part of the analysis determining whether you should be investing into a school long term. Maybe what do you think? Small six, small seven. Uh, I mean, I would just say that I know there are supervisory unions that don't have the staffing to do grant writing. I mean, I just know that's a reality. So. I don't know if this would come in added staffing if we have a class of OC still, maybe we can do it, but I don't know. I it just it seems a little prescriptive. Um about the ability to evaluate the ability as opposed to to make it a requirement. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we trying aren't we still at the point where we're trying to figure out well, how big is the problem and how do we get from where we are to where we want to be? Mm -hmm. In this case. We want to know if SUs have the capability of writing grants. If they don't, that's just part of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It just says a requirement though, mm -hmm. at this point. Not great. The length, the current language right here is a requirement. So it's saying analyze the ability or uh, investigate the ability of supervisory unions can uh, have the ability or have the um, staff. capability, staff, et cetera to apply for state federal grant. I mean, yeah, either the SU or even the uh, AOE, I mean, just someone, someone to stand up and say, we got another problem. We got, a, you know, we got all these issues, but one of the problems is we don't have grant writers. Yeah. How do we solve yeah. the grant writer problem? The working group is like vision, not not necessarily execution. Right? Yeah, so I like that. So if we have, so part of this conversation is around uh, assessing the availability of state and federal grants for these projects. So it doesn't, so we don't need to leave it at that, really. Or it's not each supervisory unit have somebody to really help to understand what state and federal grants might be out there as we move forward. That was one of the I things like that. Both things, but uh -huh. very. They have to they have to grab writers. 
right? So we'll keep six and seven very broad in terms of analyzing, looking at state and federal grants. Yeah. Yep. No, I agree with that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Go ahead. Just a comment on six or VI. To me, it reads that every supervisory union would must perform an energy audit on every building that's been a period. To me, it, that's how it reads. And I'm, I'm not sure that's really the intention. Um, but we certainly, in the concept phase, when we're trying to develop the concept of where we're going, we're not trying to pull the lever to have these guys, you know, conduct you know, facilities assessments to, to this to this de degree. I agree. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. I pulled six, and I think we just say we'll add a, kind of combine six and seven and have some kind of investigation and examination of what's available for state and federal grants. Well, if that's the I mean, if, a, if the building only for storage doesn't have a requirement to be heated or air conditioned. Yeah. That's still a school building. And then page seven, you have a, one other suggestion. Yeah, just as part of the as part of the incentive or eligibility. Um, you know, if they, if there could be some kind of aspect in regards to energy use and its consumption. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff that talks about environmental performance, which I think is very close, similar to energy use index and fuel consumption. Um, but essentially just having some kind of index potentially uh, making sure that we're investing money in our worst performing schools from an energy standpoint. So tell us the goal of that again. Um, the goal would be that if if the, the goal would be that if you have schools that have really high, a lot of schools just don't really track their energy use and their fuel consumption on a regular basis. Um, it's not something that they really look after. It's more of just a line item in their school bill. So my our my thought policy kind of on this is that if we built in an yeah, energy use index that you know, would require schools to essentially at least just write down how much fuel they're using on a regular basis when they submit their application. Um, you could at least kind of compare um, apples to apples from one school to the next to see how well, you know, if that is a well energy efficient building compared to the one next to it. And it might be used- I could a, be wrong. I've not been on a school board. Others here have. I feel as though these things are, looked at all the time, but I could be wrong. Synergy, like you're kind of... Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think HVAC systems are a huge part of the, you know, bottom line and making buildings run. And I think just my experience with rebuilding Burlington, um, we wanted to look at being LEED certified and what's the other one? LEED and... Um, there's like the Green Building Council certification or net zero requirements. Net zero, yeah, we looked at a bunch of those. Um, it just, it's such a cost savings to be efficient with your energy use. But my, Eric, my only, I'm wary only in terms of like creating anything that is a an unfunded mandate because we've seen what happens a little bit with that with PCB testing when you sort of mandate these tests and there's no money to do it. So right. that's my only that that's my only issue with yeah. any of some of this stuff. Um, so otherwise, I think they're all great ideas. Yeah, and you know, just putting them out there has helped us. At least helped me, like Senator Hashim, recognizing that we need some language in there to make certain that we are meeting our state energy goals, uh, and then putting state and federal grants out there, again, having somebody look at those and analyze those uh, so that we don't lose sight of those funding possibilities. So so your suggestions, although we sort of, well, really edited <laughs> down, they, they have produced two really important things that I think we will include in the bill. So thank you for that. Well, and then I... Oh, go ahead. I feel like I accomplished what I needed to do because that is really my main goal of really just making sure that energy use and um, kind of that CO2 and environmental impact is really kind of regarded and, and hopefully prioritized under school construction. So, so if I could, um, going back to what you just said, how do you, in page eight, 
How do you see environmental performance being different from energy use index and fuel consumption? Could, could we delete environmental performance and leave the energy use? I think both, I think those two could be looked at. I don't know exactly what environmental performance is, if that has to do with additional kind of hazardous materials inside of the schools, whether that's asbestos or PCBs or other yeah, types of environmental yeah. hazards. But, but typically I would think of environmental performance and if you're saying performance, I think of kind of CO2 output or your impact on the environment, which would be your, you know, your kind of energy use and fuel consumption. Um, I mean, think would it so be very, very similar. Would it be a, a stretch to just combine the two energy performance, comma, energy use index and fuel consumption? I mean, just it's all to me, it's all a subset. One's a subset of the other. But I'm I just... think environmental, I would just say that I think environmental performance and uh, I would just say it's different because you can have a building that uh, may not be emitting a ton of uh, CO2 um, comparatively because it's a small building next to a really big building. So the environmental performance on it, I guess, I guess they are very similar, Senator. I, I, I don't see any reason why you can't add those two together now that you mention it. So. Okay. Hey. Thanks a million, Eric. Guys, thanks so much. I really We're appreciate your time. From, uh, thanks, Eric. Renewable Energy Vermont tomorrow, but this has been a, we'll make these changes that we just discussed. We're about to hear from Ledge Council in about five minutes, so you'll see a new draft of the bill online, hopefully later today, maybe Amazing. tomorrow. Amazing. I appreciate all the work you guys do, and thanks. Um, I really thank you for your guys' time and ability to get here. And um, Thanks. A few words. So, best of luck with everything. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Yes. Cool. Bye. Back from here. Well, uh, Ms. St. James, welcome back to Senate Education. This Tuesday afternoon, April 16th at 305. We've been working on the school construction bill. And I want to first bring Senator's attention to the very last uh, page. Section five, I'm sorry, page 13 through 16. I asked uh, Beth St. James to put this in. This is from our, our Senate miscellaneous education bill. This is state aid for school construction. That's not, is this it? Is it is page. Or is it uh, public? Starts, it's pub, it starts on oh, page 13. Yep. Public construction bit. Yes. <clears throat> and goes all the way through. Senators will recall this is construction contracts, when to go put out bids. We had raised it from 500000 to 2 million. The Senate already passed it. I put it in here as a belts and suspenders, just in case we have a disaster between now and the end of the session. It's going to travel in two places. Anybody have any concerns with it? You've already voted it out. Okay. You can be right. It's honestly, yeah. I mean, the, mis bill, the miscellaneous end bill is still going to move, right? Even though we took this out. They have it. <clears throat> so if, what do you mean, take it out? Oh, wait. I think I'm just, sorry. But... So we haven't removed it from a bill. Mm -hmm. Senate's already passed it out. It's in the bill. Yeah. Our miscellaneous yeah. education bill blows up on the House side. Can't imagine it will. It's going to be in this also. Right. Ms. A. James, we have had a walkthrough with the proposer of the amendments to H871, Eric Lafayette, and we have decided uh, not to really take many of his amendments, which we'll take you through right now, but rather work through some of his wording a little bit. And so, uh, uh, speaking for the committee, well, I'll just walk us all through to make sure we're all on the same page. On page three, and we're going to have to ask you to come back to us with some wordsmithing, but we removed his section having to do with energy audits. But what we do want to make sure is that this working group, this group of people uh, that's developing this report, 
is keeping our Global Warming Solutions Act, our statewide energy goals, everything in mind during this process. And want to make sure that there's language in the bill. If there isn't language in the bill, that would use it. Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council, are you asking me if there is language in the bill that would do that? Yes. Um, potentially. So, um, and I'm sorry if I misunderstood the direction. I thought I was supposed to incorporate all of Mr. Lafayette. You were. Okay. Now it has provided us a great way to walk. Okay, through. great. Okay. And now we're just going to yank them slash edit them. Okay. So, um, if we're looking at the topics that the um, working group is required to make recommendations on or consider, mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, I would say on page eight, incentives. Right. Um, the working group needs to consider the use of incentives. Um, like if if a school put forward a plan that included some of these topics, would that would that gain them some extra money, right? Or would it move them off the priority list? These are all recommendations. So the, the working group could decide that any one of these topics was a no-go for them. But mm -hmm. on this list is environmental performance. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that meets the standards that you're talking about, uh, but it is a pretty broad concept. Um, I would say there's a whole section on environmental hazards and contaminants. So anything about energy in particular, uh, energy around uh, fossil fuel use, that kind of thing. No. Okay. Keep, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, please, I will sorry. say the working group is required to consider current law. Okay. Um, so if there are state laws on the books that would impact construction, in any topic from Act 250 to the ADA, which I know is not a state law, it's a federal law, right? Yeah. Um, if there are state or federal laws on the books that would impact a construction program, they are supposed to be taking those into account. So to the extent that there already is state requirements that would apply to school buildings, then I think that's incorporated here as far as energy efficiencies. But the, but. I'm not sure if the state's energy goals, I believe they're aspirational. I don't know. Okay. Can you check? Um, I mean, energy goals is a really broad. Possible to read out for that? Um, I believe we have goals to be renewable by a certain period, a certain date. I think it's 2030. I believe they're aspirational. And if they're aspirational, I think we should put them in here so that people can think about it and consider that. Um, I will certainly phone a friend and right. get back to you. Um, with, it, with this being a completely foreign concept to me, mm -hmm. it's possible that when I ask that question, the person I ask that question to says, well, there's a lot more to it than that. Okay. And so what I am going to pose to you all is that this bill reflects specifically what you want it to reflect. Mm -hmm. And so if you are having a conversation, if you think it is important enough to spend testimony time on this one particular topic, then perhaps it does need to be spelled out. Okay. Um, but just in general, mm -hmm. right, all applicable state and federal laws apply, regardless of whether they're called out here or not. Right, and I can just see where if the state has aspirational goals, they are not necessarily, they might not get the attention that we might want them to get, that's all. But we're going to hear tomorrow from Peter Sterling a little bit more about renewable energy goals and things like that. Okay. Anything to report, Senator Um Will we be hearing from the agency at 3.30? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for taking that. So why don't we then, Ms. St. James, 
pull uh, the recommendation on page three till we hear from Peter Sterling tomorrow uh, around the renewable needs, renewable energy community, see if there's anything that they believe we should. So no need to phone a friend. We'll talk to them about what they think uh, this bill should reflect in terms of the state's renewable energy goals. Sure, and I will just encourage you when you take that testimony to remind whoever you are hearing from that there's two very distinct pieces to this bill. One is the master facilities plan, which is what we're talking about now, yeah. which is very different than what the working group is required to consider, right? So if they have recommendations for the long-term school construction plan, that's in the working group, not in the master facilities plan. So uh, you can strike Mr. Uh, Lafayette's recommendation on, on page three. On three, yep. And all of his recommendations on page four. Okay. And if you go to page seven, you can strike all of those as well. However, what it did generate a conversation about was the need to possibly have the working group consider state and federal grants in the process and wondering if there's anything in the bill already about that. Um, there was a lot of discussion about who to talk to um, to find out where that federal money lives and how, I mean, how folks could get at it. Mm -hmm. um, and if I remember correctly, there's no one state or federal grant agency, right? That's the holder of all state or federal grants. They're yeah. all, they all fall under the different agencies that regulate those particular topics. Yeah. So um, there was, so we've required um, the um, U.S. Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, um, they do, I believe, have some grants related to schools and rural communities. Mm -hmm. And so that they are on the list of have to consult with the U.S. Department of Education for the same reasons. Mm -hmm. okay. They know of grants out there in other um, in other um Eight, you know, federal agencies that are related to the education. There was discussion. It's not in the bill, and so I, it, it was either dropped or there was a decision made. Um, but certainly, consulting with the federal delegate, Vermont's federal delegation, um, is an option. But um, let's see, there's a specific piece about money in here. Let's see. Yes, there is. Uh, maybe not. No, I don't think it's specifically called out that they um, they need to consider. I don't see why we can't start this. Honestly. I think we the grant, the federal grant, we pay opportunities. We are. Okay. We're just wondering if somewhere, we're striking uh, everything on page seven. We're just wondering if there should be somewhere in there to for them to explore state and federal grants anywhere in the bill in this process i mean yeah if, please. if a school or, or an su wants to explore grants i mean it, does it need to be written in law that they well the senator Bulick's point they all don't have the resources to explore sometimes federal and state grants so should we have some group should we have this working group in some way consider and help people understand what's out there. 
I mean, it, from the way, yeah. just real quick, just from yeah, the way I'm reading it, it seems more as if it's a requirement that's being conferred onto SUs rather than the creation of a couple of people to, you know, reach out to different SUs and say, hey, here's a grant and here's how to apply for it. Um, so that's how I'm interpreting. Senator Weeks. Um, if we're talking about the working group that starts kind of uh, outlining the who the members are of the working group or who they consult, starting on page 11. I think that uh, there's two aspects. One is, we talked about this a month or so ago when we first started session still, the bond bank, the Vermont mm -hmm. bond bank, money. And then all these, you know, the grants, and I'm not, I have no experience with education grants, so, you know, just say hypothetically, and what I West might have done on this working group, mm -hmm. we, we need that information. Somehow we need that, that collective needs to be recognized so we can understand the bigger problem. You know, how, how much of this can we solve with grants, bonds, you know, et cetera? That's all part of the fundamental problem that the working group needs to wrestle with. So again, I don't know who, who the right group is, but or if it's a whole series of organizations, but knowing what grants are available, I think is big part of solving this problem. Or it's a part of solving this problem. Bond bank being the other. I know, but the question is how do you recognize that in the bill? Yeah. Yeah. Senator Williams. So does the AOE have any responsibility on this? Construction process. Well, it says, I know, yes, yeah, SUs, AOE, right. grant, subject matter. Right. You know, it's like, I know. The end of the concept. I mean, I'm not looking to get into what else to do, but. Joe Briggs Campbell, I think, the first of all, that, is she coming in? The Agency of Education is the only non legislative member of this committee. So there are, they have a seat at the table. Oh no, just waving general. Ms. St. James, do you want to add anything to this in terms of, I think what we're trying, what we're grappling with, is there anything here, and maybe the answer is no, that needs to be done to put state and federal grant opportunities on the table so SUs don't have to figure this out? Is there anything that needs to sort of be looked at or examined? And maybe, again, the answer is no. I think that's a policy decision. I understand that, but is so, there anything in there now that does it? No, I, th I, th I think I've walked you through where I think that conversation landed, and that was adding the U.S. Department of Education and the Department of Agricultural and Rural Development to the list of required consult consults. If you want the working group to, as a part of forming recommendations for a state aid to school construction plan, to consider how state funded or state and federal funded grants may be factored into this program, I would I think that's something you would need to spell out. That's what I think we're having to put in. Then I would add I have my suggestion I see no would be adding, that. Yeah. adding just a charge. Another another letter. Um basically just what I just said. Right. That's it, period. Okay. But I agree completely with the legislative council as always. Uh, but um, you don't think the bond bank should be on this list? The Vermont bond bank? The, the, the bond bank was in the construction group that we were on this summer. Yeah, I get that. But here we are. So, page yeah. 11 on the bottom of the page, or line 16, we're looking at the working group shall consult. I think we need to consult. That group needs to consult the bond bank. Bond bank needs to be part of this. Just I know this is rural, now. U.S. rural. I'm this looking to see if anybody else has an issue. I mean, it's a cop. They're just consulting this, and I have no issue with consulting with the bond bank. I don't know. It looks like that's fine to add that. Uh, St. James, got it. Fine. I mean, I tell you something you don't want to hear. Do you all have them in yet? We have not. Oh, they gave a presentation to have that. Oh, good. Great. Great. Morgan, can we, who's the point person? We'll find out. And then, again, I kept the old notes, but uh, previously we've been talking about, uh, again, who should we consult? We have in here uh, the, the school boards, the superintendents, 
We talked about the educator voice, which was NEI. And we talked about the principal's voice, which is principal's association. I'm just wondering, again, it doesn't need to be an like all-inclusive list because of the line item M, but I mean, I think it might make me feel a little more empowered. To yeah, I remember when these, we've added the energy performance. Wait, is J, was that a recommendation from Eric also? Yeah. Let's take that out. Uh, J? Yeah. Um, none of Eric's, just to be direct, recommendations are going to move forward as written. You can remove them all. What we took from him was were the conversation about renewable energy, which will continue tomorrow, and uh, the conversation we just had around state and federal uh, dollars. In terms of the list of people to consult, listen, we can make this list as long as people want. Uh, I think the committee agreed that we wanted to hear from Vermont Legal Aid Disability Law Project, as well as Department of Disabilities. But if you want to add more people and the committee's okay with it, that's fine. You propose? Adding NEA, Principal Association, and Bond Bank. And I think I heard someone at some point a few minutes ago mention Vermont's federal delegation. Sure, that was involved. I believe I mentioned that, and that was just about someone who's aware of federal grants. So the proposal's on the table from Senator Weeks to add to the list of, of people, organizations being consulted the NEA, the Principal Association, the Federal Delegation, the Superintendent's Association, the Bond Bank. Senator Hashim. Um, on a somewhat different topic, we also talked about the reuse of buildings. Uh, is that, is there anything that we can add to that? Or would that, do we think that would fall under E, for the uh, Division of Historic Preservation? Thanks. Good question. Let's just take care of this motion first, and then we'll move to that. Anybody have any concerns with Senator Weeks's proposal, adding a member, making sure that the NEA is consulted, Principals Association, Federal Delegation, Superintendent's Association, and the Bond Bank? Can, can I back up a step? Yeah. We're, we're saying who's going to be on the working group. What what point do you... No, these are... These, this, these are the people that are consulted. Right. Okay. Yep. But at what point do you sign duties and responsibilities for the people that are on the... I mean, what, what role are they going to play? So that's in the earlier part of the bill. Oh, yeah. Yeah. These are groups right now that are being consulted as things move forward. I think we're fine with that. Go ahead with Senator uh, Leakes' proposal. So Bond Bank? Yeah. NEA? NEA, Superintendent's Association, Principal Association, School Board Association, Federal Delegation, I think that's everybody. Okay. Can I comment on Senator yeah. Hashim's? Because I think you're on a really good point uh, as far as kind of the architectural or the reuse. I think there's two, two, two aspects to it. One is reuse, architectural preservation, reuse. Second is uh, ownership, shifting ownership from the schools to municipalities or what have you. I think there are two different issues, two different, potentially two different uh, groups that would, that would be involved. I think they're both equally important because we don't know, I mean, if it's if we give up the, 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 the school building in, in, in preference for new construction, that issue about reuse is, is critical. Yeah, I think, um, so I mean, technically is it, the SU that owns the building when it's schooled, or is it the town that owns the building when it's schooled? The district. The district. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think LDA? Would... No. It's the school district. The school district. Okay. I think it would make sense to. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking of you know this public building, right? First refusal to go to the town do with it whenever they see fit and then you know if there is a if they decide that they want to sell that asset that they've been 
investing in and using for decades and got us up to that. Yeah, I can just speak to my personal experience. We've had some buildings in Burlington that were really nicely located for the university to have interest. So they bought buildings from us. From the school district? Yeah. Um, just as an example, like an entity like that could potentially buy. Um, but I mean, is, would that be a requirement of this bill? Like that's the that's the tricky part. Of it. Probably thinking of that. Uh, yeah. But considering it, I think what Senator Shim starting to notice how can we put something in there so that the working group considers Sorry, yes. Great. Page six. <laughs> Been so patient. Line oh, actually it's on page seven, but to orient you on page six, line fourteen, eligibility criteria. The working group has to consider at a minimum the following state aid eligibility criteria. And then if you go to page seven, line four, a requirement for SU master planning process that would require consideration of the adaptive reuse of schools for housing or other social infrastructure. For housing or other social infrastructure. Could that be define social infrastructure? That's the best thing. I would just rely on the plain meaning of the terms. So, uh, you know. I don't know it. So. I would have to look in a dictionary to see okay. to what the term infrastructure is defined as. That's not a defined term. But no, either. social infrastructure? I think what this is getting at is community centers. Okay. Um, you know, community hub type buildings. Okay. But if UVM wanted to build, there's nothing in there that would allow UVM to sort of purchase it. No, this, remember that this bill is just requiring recommendations to you all. They cannot write law. Well, actually, it's legislators, so you're going to write the law. You can't pass the law, right? You need all of your colleagues to do that. So all of this is, is recommendations. So it's quite possible, and it can happen under current law, that one of the recommendations is the piece of current law that allows a school district to sell a school building an asset to anyone remains. But as part of the master planning process, there needs to be perhaps a tiered consideration for community use, right? And if that's not, um, and, and maybe community use is defined as far as the working group is considered as the, the university. Sorry. Yeah, now I propose that on page seven, line five, we end the sentence with reuse of schools, period. And then and then because there could be a, a variety of options in addition to housing and social infrastructure, which I believe would have priority, but but uh, may decide just to sell the school, which is not it's not on that list. You know, sell it to UVM as you know, education purpose. Mm -hmm. Sir, can I? Can I do that? Can I interrupt this? This is about saving the school in Roxbury. That's what I'm all the, about. We can't take that testimony right now. We're just in the middle of a of a committee hearing. But if you can hold on a little bit toward the end, we can have you say a few words. Oh, sure. Okay. But, yeah. Thank I, I could come back or whatever. Hang around for a little you. bit. You never know. Sure. Please. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Question came up earlier at Act 46 when, when the state took out of school the buildings. Physical building. Remember the towns gave them up for okay. dollar. I'm not familiar with okay. that part of Act 46. Okay. Well, I was well, I was on the select board. I'm just wondering if uh, you know with, if they decide not to use it for a school building again, does it go back to the town? This school, so um, think of a school district as any other business with an asset. Yeah. So if the school district decides to close a school, if they own that, if they have a mortgage and a loan out on that, or they own it outright, that's an asset. And there's certain laws about what they, how they, you know, can transfer that asset, whose power is it, whether it's an electorate vote or it's a school board's decision. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that would go into each individual decision. But I, you know, think of a school building as an, an asset. For that school district. Any objections to Senator Weeks's proposal for line okay. uh, page seven, line five, for the period after schools? It's a very broad. 
It's a difference between reuse and adapt. Oh, I didn't hear get rid of it, the word adapt. I'm just, no, I'm, I'm, I like that idea. <laughs> Uh, we, our school building is oh, the sir, sir, I'm, hall. Sir, we just can't have uh, just random. Yeah, just have to hold off, please. Can you tell me what you would like the sentence to read or this this phrase? Well, we're having that conversation right now. So the first question is, what does adaptive reuse mean? And we're putting it to the drafter. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that adaptive has a plain meaning. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so... Um, it's be reused for something to yeah something else yeah. yeah used for something else you are uh, uh adapting to the circumstances it's no longer used for one circumstance so you're adapting to uh, new circumstances so what do people feel how do people feel about putting a, a period after schools no oh, so. great we'll do that it's no reach, you're on a roll. Yes. Uh, anything else in this bill in terms of edits or suggestions? We'll hear from the bond bank, and we're going to hear from Rev, and hopefully move this puppy by Friday, uh, if we can get there. But if you would put it down for a vote on Friday, that would be great. I we said uh, one other comment. So on page eight, line 13, we're incentivizing for newer and fewer. And I believe that previous conversation was we need to balance, find balance between newer and fewer and architectural preservation. I don't want to incentivize, I don't think we should incentivize one versus the other. I think that they think recognition of one approach versus the other approach can be unique to schools. You're on page 18? Uh, page 18, right? Line, Line 13. 13. Um, I think that incentives can be should be recognized for newer and fewer in one case, but architectural preservation in another case. It's all school dependent. What's your proposal? I'm a little confused. So on that line, are you adding something? You want to add architectural preservation? I like the yeah. So okay, newer and fewer versus architectural preservation. Period. Uh, let the, the, the word doctors figure it I just think we need to recognize that it's not, you don't incentive, we shouldn't incentivize only for newer and fewer. Uh -huh. Some solutions may be historical preservation, right? Readaptation, you know, renovation, et cetera. That's all I'm saying. Don't 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 reward someone for tearing down a building. In fact, the building could be saved and and morphed into a 21st century facility. So, do it all the time. It's St. James. This is all policy, so I will draft whatever you'd like me to draft. I just want to state again that this is all topics right. that the committee is coming back and making recommendations on, so it is not requiring anyone to adopt an incentive for newer and fewer buildings. This language would just require the committee to consider whether that's an appropriate incentive. Yeah. And then the, the one right under that is major renovations to improve pre-K through 12 systems. I think this is funny. Um, yes. So I can see kind of that might that might encompass that historic preservation piece there if we're talking about major renovations. Um, but I can certainly add language if you want historic preservation to be considered as a specific incentive. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm fine. I don't see any big, I don't, it's not a, something that I'm super concerned about. We put it in, we're going to have another look see tomorrow. Well, I think go ahead and put it in. Okay, I would suggest adding it just as a totally separate. Please do. Yeah. Okay. Please do. Yeah. And then if it works for you, Ms. St. James, is it possible to get this new version posted later today? No. <laughs> I'm just thinking you all have me while drafting ops is open. Yeah. So I could not, we could not, I could not get it edited. Okay. And then back to you all probably in normal business hours. Okay. So here's the, the little time crunch that we're under. We want 
we want to move it hopefully by Friday. Mm -hmm. We have we know you're not going to be here for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow we're going to have Rev in. We'd like them to be able to respond to something somewhat cleaner. Sure. Yeah. If you can let me out of here before four, by four, then I will work. I don't know when you will get it back, but I will work on it um, with drafting ops before I leave today. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Amelia. Final point of business is actually 8630. Heather Boucher of the Agency of Education is not able to come in today to talk about this. Correct. They would like to bring us some language on Thursday. So did they give you a sense of whether or not they wanted to delete their current testimony or they're just going to bring us some new language out there instead? They're going to bring us some new language, but they wanted me to reiterate to the committee that they have very serious concerns about the current form of the bill. Um, they think it uh, would require a lot of... Um, you know, work on the part of the AOE and that there is now a new secretary of Ed who needs to be brought up to speed and it just is complicated. Okay. So they're going to talk to us with like. All time. right. So does anybody, please go ahead. I'm sorry, what bill are we talking about? Uh, oh, 630. Okay. Does anyone object to uh, postponing the VOSIS conversation until Thursday when the agency of education brings us new language and we can bring this St. James go um, and help us get ready for school construction? Um, I'm happy to do that. I just, Beautiful. I will not be available after two on Thursday. Totally. We'll just have them in, You're have a chit chat, hear what okay. they have to say. Okay. And then, if you don't mind having a look see, that would be great. And they are going to bring legislative language, or are they going to bring bullet points? Well, the word was language. I didn't hear the word legislative. Okay. I would just encourage you this late in the game. Legislative language. If you are seeking language from anyone, especially the agency, if it could be in the form of recommended legislative language, that I think will be the most efficient use of everyone's time. Great. Perfect. Morgan's on it. Recommended legislative language. Strike throughs, new language, whatever it is. Okay. We're right. going to get there. It's going to be great. You're going to be the star. <laughs> I'm starring a lot of committees this week. Um, anything else while you have me? No, I think you should get out of here as quickly as possible. Done. Um, thank you. I will. Thank you. I've already alerted drafting ops. They know to be expecting something. Um, I will send that to Morgan. Do you want that new draft set to the whole committee? Or great. Just, okay. Being part of it. You're able to do that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. My friend, so have a seat. Hot seat. Not every day we have somebody pop in that wants to share a few words off, not off the street, but tell us what's on your mind. You don't have a lot of time, but we want to hear. Um, mm. Well, if you could pass that down, that's one of the most good work that I It's a proposal to try to save the school. So would you just, um, just so for the historical record, uh, yes, sir? would you just say your name and where oh, you're from? My name is Emma Dale David Santi. Um, I'm from Roxbury, Vermont. Yes. And lived there for since 1979, roughly. Um, own a house and part of another house with my family. Um, and I'm just trying to save the school um, because it seems um, that the people with children first, second, third, and fourth grade do not like the idea of their kids spending three hours a day on the bus going to Montpelier. So, Mr. Sandy, I just want to stop you for a second. Can you tell us right now, and I haven't followed it carefully, well, frankly at all, the Roxbury Village School, is it under threat of closing? Is it closing? Is something happening there that we should... It's, yeah, it's closing it is the closing. end of the year. Okay, so a vote has been taken to close it. By the board... By the small player school board, if I'm not okay. mistaken. I haven't gone there to follow them. I'm, I'm trying to get on the, I'm going to meet with the transition team tonight and get on the agenda for our, for the next school board meeting in Roxbury, which is in May sometime. And um, we 
we basically there's there's and I was interested to hear you talking about historical. Mm -hmm. We have a historical town hall that's attached to the school. Um, they're, they use the same furnace, the same water, same heating system, everything. Um, and I'm going to go to a meeting tonight with the transition team to try to get on the agenda for the next meeting in May in Roxbury. And you're probably going to freak on what I tell you. Um, we want the school back for two reasons, one of which is we want to start this school, or I do. We'll see what the voters think. But this is immaterial to my business. I repair barns, have for 20 some odd years, a barn doctor. It's a, a trademark registered with the Secretary of State's office. What we have is we have a problem, and I've been on them, I'll tell you, for, I live, I have two houses. I have one next to the store, and I have one that's already across from the school. And I have watched the gutter on the north side of the town hall fill up for two years. And you can see I got photographs, I'm going to get them developed, of black spots starting on the outside, so it's starting to rot. And we can't fix that unless we own the building and they won't give us the building back. So this is where you're going to freak out. I'm going to go to the meeting when I, when the, when the May meeting comes up, if I can get on the agenda. And the reason I want to be on the agenda is because I want to have all my ducks in a row, because if they don't give us back the school, I'm going to occupy the school and I'm going to go to jail. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. We're going to get them all the bad publicity they need. They need more of it. Everybody in town hates them for what they did already. And they want to bring back the afternoon education and keep our school. Now, we what we want, and, and I'll tell you why. I was on the school board for three years during supervisory union system. And this is sort of similar to that, I believe. Um, not that. You know, but anyway, uh, my board chair, who is a really good guy, who I would have be the assistant board if I can get him to do it, um, we both agree that the supervisory union system may be great for the for a lot of the schools, but it sure milks the hell out of the small towns. It's like they don't want small schools. And everybody that went to a small school talks of it lovingly. Well... We want to keep our school. And it's more than that. It's it's the community. You know what I mean? And and I, I don't know what help I can get, but I'm going to meet with the education commissioner and and you know, I'm going to be that guy that's gonna probably fight her because I I don't know if that's true or not, but I understood that she was in the habit of closing small schools. I don't know if that's true or not. That's some of the scuttlebutt, I guess. Um, I hope it's not the case. Um, what I think we're going to be able to help you with, for what it's worth, is I want to introduce you to uh, a fellow by the name. Do you know Larry Sackowitz? No, I never met him. I know Hooper somewhat. Let's and try. He, you and I are going to meet, or are going to try to track down uh, Larry Sackowitz. He is the rep for your district. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to be particular. He, he may be able to be helpful. We can track them down as soon as we adjourn. Hooper isn't very helpful. Well, we'll have we'll have uh see what Larry can do. You email? Yeah, I, I have to go to the library. I'm a poor guy. I mean, I had to give up my phone to do this, okay? Because I didn't have enough money to pay my ta my taxes and my power bill and my phone bill. So I paid my power bill and my taxes, and now I just paid my phone bill. I'm waiting for it to be restored. So my phone isn't working until they restore my phone bill. Well, I do. Not paying it. I, I appreciate I'm a poor guy. Well, I appreciate your commitment, and I do appreciate that you're willing to go to the library to do this. Um, and I do think a conversation with Larry Sackowitz and Ted Fisher. He's with the Agency of Education. Do you live locally? How far? Do you live? Do you live in Roxbury? Yes. Yeah. Right in the village. Yeah. So, would you get emails and phone numbers for Larry Sackowitz? Sakowitz? Sakowitz. S-A-T-C-O-W-I-T-C. No. 
uh, he's, uh, and then uh, Ted Fisher, we could get his email and phone number, and we will give those to uh, Mr. Santi. And then I think those are two good people to start with, see what they have to say, right. and we can always have a conversation with you again. You know that, uh, and I need to know the more the details that I'll get from them about the Lincoln School. Yeah. I guess they're on their own. I don't know. That's what I've been told, that the Lincoln School is a school. That's what I've wanted before the, the, the red, whatever you want to call it, the original education. Um, I saw that it wasn't going to work a long time ago, and I wrote stuff against it, and I put it on the bulletin board at the post office in Roxbury. Yeah. A fella named Ben Pinkus, who's been talked about in the in the news. Oh, yeah. As, a, as opposed works. to this. Yeah. Um, they've lived on the hill for quite a long time. Oh, they have? Good people. Oh, yeah. They've been here for many, many, many years. The father was uh, a selectman at one time, and he was a, a flower grower. He was actually a, a teacher um, at... Um, um, that's the school in Boston, the tech school in Boston. Tech Wentworth? No. Um, uh, what the heck is it? Institute of Technology, I think. MIT? Well, MIT, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, taught, he taught film, basically documentaries. Is what he yeah, I, I have the, the family confused with somebody else. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Santi at this point on this? Because I do think the next step would be to connect him to these two folks See how that goes. Yeah. I think Ted might actually sit down and have a cup of coffee with you, understand the issue, and then if there are changes that they could recommend, they could bring them to the committee. What do you think about the fact that I may have to occupy the school and go to jail? Not thrilled about it, I'll be honest with you. But let's someone's got to somebody's got to do something. Right. Nobody's doing anything except crying, you know, and there are people with tears actually crying on this. Yeah. And and you know they want us to help host an afternoon program to keep our school. We don't want nothing to do with them. We never did the beginning because what we wanted to do was go with U thirty two. I believe strongly. I can't prove it, but I believe strongly that the education department manipulated us and told us we couldn't go with U thirty two. Maybe they had enough students. I think it was fourteen hundred. We got stuck with Montpelier, a high tax town. And probably that's the reason why the towns around there didn't want to go with Montpelier. I don't know. My own, you know, concoctions of ideas. Um, but we never really wanted to be with Montpelier to begin with. It, it's totally different. You know what I mean? We had one one fellow, a lawyer, um, Sent his daughter there and she became a music teacher. And I think she lives over in the valley or teaches somewhere around. She taught in Burlington for a while and in Massachusetts. But mostly everybody went to U32 or Northfield, you know. And and that's what I one of the things that I fought under consolidation was certain people like Ben Pinkus, who fought me terribly, he didn't even know what he was fighting, needed to go to a needed to have choice. To go to a school where he thrived. He went to U32 and he thrived. He tried to beat up on somebody, one of Chunk Goni, one of the well, one of the maintenance guys at, at Northfield, you know, and he got in trouble. And so he thrived at U32. And we could we just, you know what I mean, couldn't go there. Personally, my idea is that the education department ought to send supervisors to whatever schools to see what we're doing. Got no problem with you checking up on us, telling us what to do. Yeah. No problem with that. Just leave us alone and let us go and try to do our thing and keep our kids. And the other thing is, it was made apparent to me during this discussions that we don't have enough kids. So that's partially why I wanted to bring back 7th and 8th grade back there. We have room upstairs. We have the multi-purpose room, which is the town hall. And and um, so um we could we could make that work i mean i believe strongly and i've been waiting for this for a long time i've been on the poor side for a long long time i make good money when i work on barns i make real good money but i don't work all year long um 
and um, I've been waiting for what's what's going on. What's going on is we're at our taxing limit, and I'm trying to tell the selectmen that they're talking about stuff last night. This is the tip of the iceberg. It's going to get worse from here on. You know, when do you ever see Montpelier vote no? So we have never. a final comment or question that I'm going to have to adjourn, but you're yeah. welcome to stick around and hang out and chat with me a little bit more. Okay. Final comment. I just wanted to say thank you for coming in. I, I, I appreciate know, your listening yeah, to me. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I don't know if there's much that this particular committee can do, but I think what you're bringing to us is a harbinger of what's to come. I think we have, you know, we have declining enrollment across the state. Yeah. Um, we have fewer kids and we have rising costs. So it's a, we're in a moment, a pivotal moment where we have to decide, you know, what we're going to do and yeah. um, it's not going to be easy, but it's really, I appreciate you being so passionate about your kids. It's really important. My kids are grown. They were home educated. But anyway, can I leave you with this? Sure. This is the, the this is the country. You have a budget that needs to be cut. You have two qualified people. And I told this to my to Hooper, and I told it to Ben Baker, this guy in town, and they both come up with the answer. You have a budget that needs to be cut. You have two qualified people to cut the budget. One that's rich like Hooper, one is poor like me. Which one do you send? Hooper said, I said the poor person, there's your problem. You got no poor people. Everybody around here is doing pretty well. We live it every day down in the streets. You guys haven't got a clue a lot of times, and I don't mean to be disparaging or anything else. I thank you very much for listening, but I just have to say this. There's a hell of a lot of people that don't make $30,000 a year that are out there hurting. And 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 what these people don't understand is you've raised 5% a year. That's compounding interest. Next year is 10%. You know what I mean? It compounds year after year. Now we're at a point where it finally starting to hurt certain group of people and it ain't gonna be easy you guys don't get put in jail because you won't be money for any good they'll let me out it's not violent <laughs> i'm just I'm just gonna take over a building to get it back that's all all right you know, we're adjourned for today thank you all i right, thank, thank you very much for thank you me. mr santi these, these are the emails and i know i just want to pass them along okay. to you thank you